Okay, I would li really uh, like to thank Joseph Tyveson and all the organizers for this impeccably organized conference. Um, all the way down to the weather, I think everything is like clock clockwork. Uh, I would like to tell you today about uh, time reversal based quantum metrology um, and relations to spin squeezing and will tie in very nicely with both the Monday talks and what we heard just about, we heard just from Norman Yao. So um, I will tell you how to generate spin squeezing in an optical transition clock. Um, and then I would like to tell you about a new paradigm, which I believe can be very important in the future, where uh, one can do time reversal based quantum metrology beyond the standard quantum limit using not only the one axis twisting Hamiltonian, but in general any fast scrambling or, or, or large class of fast scrambling Hamiltonians. And I will, would like to tell you a little bit about experiments along that direction. Um, and then finally, I would like to point out what I think is a pretty deep connection between scrambling of quantum information and quantum metrology beyond the standard quantum limit. But before that, I would like to start with a prelude, some technology that I think would be important and useful for many, many atomic physics experiments. Um, and that's the use of machine learning to uh, optimize complex experimental sequences. In particular, in this part, I would like to tell you about machine learning accelerated Bose-Einstein condensation by optical cooling. So already a few years back, we had figured out how to generate uh, Bose-Einstein condensation in uh, rubidium by optical, by laser cooling alone. We were basically combining a technique of compressing in a 2D lattice um, atoms into a smaller and smaller region of tubes, increasing the density with a Raman sideband cooling technique where the trick was really um, to choose, carefully choose the tuning from atomic resonance in between molecular resonances in such a way to minimize the loss, atomic loss at higher densities, the light induced loss that has all these decades before uh, prevented laser cooling to Bose-Einstein condensation. Um, we then um, generalized this to, um, you know, more accessible system, uh, maybe for many experiments in a cross dipole trap where we uh, managed to do the Doppler version of Raman cooling, so not Raman sideband cooling, but Doppler Raman cooling, where you remove atoms from a higher velocity class and pack them back in a, a lower velocity class, and then remove the ent entropy from the system by optical pumping. And we had reached um, Bose Einstein condensation in this cross dipole trap with a, a small condensate. And however, this is a highly nonlinear uh, system. It, the Doppler profile keeps changing as you cool. Um, when you get close to the recall energy in cooling, then you get a recall induced random walks, which complicates things in the system. And also you are you know, trying to cool across a phase transition, so you have a sudden density increase in the Bose-Einstein condensate, which increases the light induced loss. So it was a very hard uh, system to optimize um, for us uh, experimentally. So we asked ourselves, you know, is this a good process for machine learning? So we set up a system where we essentially the same setup across dipole trap, two dipole traps, uh, and we took a machine learning algorithm M loop that we allowed to control a variety of parameters in time dependent steps. So we allowed it to control the two dipole traps depths. We allowed it to control uh, the power of the Raman coupling beam that drives the two photon Raman transitions between velocity classes. We allowed it to control uh, the power of the optical pumping beam, so the rate at which entropy is removed from the system, as well as the magnetic field that sets the resonance condition uh, for the Raman process and chooses the velocity classes. The system then takes an image on a, on a camera, an atomic cloud, um, from which we can extract the atom number. We found that the temperature was not so easy to extract, so we, larger, we rather fitted the peak optical dens density as given here. We then constructed a cost function out of the two parameters, optical depth and atom number, that was then fed into this artificial neural network algorithm. We also allowed the algorithm in a uh, separate stage to optimize the mod loading into the cross dipole trap. And so this, this is what the algorithm came up with. This movie is um, slowed down by a factor of 20. Um, so you can identify various stages. If I catch it from the beginning again, the mod phase is not shown here. There's a loading into first, it decides to load into one dipole trap. It applies Raman cooling for a few hundred milliseconds. And then the algorithm decided once a small BEC was formed to switch off the Raman cooling and perform evaporation. This is not what we told it to do, but that's what it came up with. So in the end, we had manually optimized and had managed to get a three-second 
uh, Bose-Einstein condensate, relatively small, as I've shown you before. The algorithm shortened that by a factor of uh, five or six to about half a second, uh, including mod loading time. So this is an extremely simple setup, no 2D mods, no Zeeman, trans no Zeeman cooling, just the background vapor from which we load the cross dipole trap, and the BEC is formed in this, um, sorry, in this record time of um, half a second. Uh, the system also achieve, achieved in the cooling a gamma. This is the ratio of logarithmic phase space density increase to atom number loss of 16. You know, typical evaporative cooling has maybe three. And gamma sem, sem, equals seven was what we managed to do manually. So this means that it managed to improve, improve the phase space density by 16 orders of magnitude by losing only one order of magnitude in atom number. And as I said, consistently, um, whenever the BEC was formed, it actually found that evaporative cooling was the way to go for the final stage. It turns off the Raman cooling in various ways. Sometimes it turns off the Raman coupling, sometimes the optical pumping, sometimes it detunes the B field to take the transition out of resonance, but this is what it decides to do. And then I think this will amuse um, Bill Philip. Um, we were taking the mod, and the algorithm found a way to load the same atom number, or even slightly larger atom number, into the mod in one tenth of the time. And what it did is um, it made the traps very deep, and it switched the mod tuning quite considerably. And so this algorithm had discovered gray molasses. We had been doing with red molasses, and it found gray molasses. So fortunately, we knew about it you know, from <laughs> many decades back. Otherwise, we would have wondered what's going on. OK, so um, um, this is you know, some of the curves that it does. It first traps in one dipole trap. It lowers the dipole trap to increase, to decrease the density while it's Raman cooling while the density increases. And then this is approximately where Bose-Einstein condensation starts to happen. At that point, it turns off the Raman cooling, turns off the evaporative cooling, and compresses in some way, as you have seen before, in the, where it first evaporates along the long trap and then through gravity vertically. And the system can do um, pure Bose-Einstein condensates like we see here. And this is this uh, gamma equals 16 increase that it managed to find in the system. So we found also that the cost parameter determines you know, what we achieve in the end. So we can tune this cost parameter, give it more weight to the atom number or more weight to the temperature. And so if the cost parameter is just the atom number, it comes up with this you know, tiny condensate on top of a Gaussian distribution. And then as we tune this cost parameter, it can make uh, purer and purer condensates at the at the end at the expense of atom number. So basically by fine tuning this cost parameter, and I think this is a lesson to be learned for all machine learning, the cost parameter choice is really critical uh, for what the system is doing. So I believe this is a powerful technique to optimize complex experimental sequences with nonlinear dynamics. The process can deal with unknown noise or imperfections in the system that you may not know about because it can you know, avoid, um, say, heating at some trap frequencies, etc. And it also presents a challenge and an opportunity in the sense that you know, we see these sometimes strange nonlinear sequences, and the question is whether we can come up with, whether we can learn something from this physically. Right? Can we interpret these sequences that gives us insight into you know, what we could do to improve the system? So that was about um, you know, machine learning. I think that it can be applied, and we are starting our group to apply it to many different uh, systems, and I think it can be used to apply, apply to many different um, experimental sequences that have such nonlinear dynamics. Now to spin squeezing, Norman gave a wonderful talk, so um, mu much of this will be familiar, so I won't even dwell here. The simplest Hamiltonian is, that creates spin squeezing is this one axis twisting Hamiltonian. As Norm said, the Z dependent rotation about the Z axis creates these spin squeeze states. Um, this goes back to Kitigawa and Dueda in 1993. And we implement this Hamiltonian by placing the atoms in a cavity um, and then having strong coupling between the atoms and the cavity. And this leads to this characteristic vacuum Rabi splitting of the cavity resonance. So we split with a magnetic field the excited state structure. We consider this level here. We park the cavity on this resonance, one half to three halves. And when you put enough atoms in there, you get this vacuum Rabi splitting uh, by the ensemble like so, we then park our laser on the side of the cavity resonance, and as I'll show you in a moment, this uh, creates this SE squared a squeezing Hamiltonian, essentially, as James already described, if you think about quantum fluctuations that change the effective population of this uh, MF sublevel down here, this is our spin one half system, then uh, fluctuations will move the cavity resonance either closer to your laser or further away from your laser, 
and that will change the power inside the cavity, and the light inside the cavity will then produce a light shift proportional to the intensity inside the cavity, and so effectively it will give rise to spin squeezing. More formally speaking, the Hamiltonian has three terms, you know, the um, energy of the light inside the cavity, the energy of the atoms, and then this um, um, Q and D type coupling term between the number of photons inside the cavity and the SZ of the, of the, the atomic SZ. And if you evolve this uh, as in a Taylor series expansion, if you're in a linear regime, uh, then you can evolve this in, uh, in terms of derivatives of the photon number inside the cavity with SZ. And then the first interesting term, there's a trivial SZ term that you can easily echo away. And then the first uh, and dominant term is this SZ squared uh, squeezing term with some strength of the atom light coupling. So you get, get this one axis twisting Hamiltonian. Um, however, um, this is in the ideal world in, in, in practice because we're sending light into the cavity. This is an open quantum system. So there's also atom light entanglement, which makes the process uh, non unitary. Um, so, however, we can deal with that. It turns out that if we analyze here as a function of the light atom detuning, the strength of the one axis twisting Hamiltonian, uh, the strength of the one axis twisting parameter chi, which is this red curve here and then the Fischer information about the light field contained in the atomic state, or if you want the atom light entanglement, then you can see here that the atom light entanglement falls off much more quickly when you go away from resonance than the one axis twisting parameter. And so by having enough atoms and the cavity in the strong coupling regime, we can simply sacrifice some of the strength of the spin squeezing in order to suppress very strongly the atom light entanglement and make this a near unitary evolution, which allows us to treat this with uh, with Hamiltonian dynamics. Um, the other very important feature is, so we park, for instance, here, and we generate this SC squared Hamiltonian plus H. But what will be very important is, if you simply switch the light frequency from here to here, you can see that this red parameter, this one axis twisting parameter, chi, changes sign, in this case, from negative to positive. So we can very easily switch the sign of the Hamiltonian. Now, in unitary Hamiltonian evolution, switching the sign of the Hamiltonian is equivalent to an evolution backwards in time. And this is where this time reversal comes from, for our, our ability to take the many-body Hamiltonian and switch its sign in a controlled way. So this is what our system uh, looks like schematically. Uh, we have a magic wavelength trap inside, inside a cavity. Uh, we have another magic wavelength lattice along the clock beam so that we are Doppler free. We can apply a clock laser. Uh, these are ytterbium atoms um, on the clock transition. You have seen um, June and James and others talk about it and Adam Kaufman as well. Um, so we have the system. We use the cavity to squeeze. We simply send in light, as I showed you before, away from the hybridized atom cavity resonance uh, at the, the chosen frequency, and that creates the spin squeezing. We also use the cavity to read out the atomic states. Simply, we can scan uh, over the vacuum Rabi splitting profile and from that uh, extract the SE parameter of the atoms. So this is what the turbine looks like. It has the ground state with two nuclear sublevels and plus minus one half. It has a strong UV transition, a UV mod, an intermediate strength, what we call narrow line mod. This is also the light that we use for spin squeezing with a line width of 180 kilohertz of the excited state. And then here's the yellow clock transition. And so the way we do spin squeezing um, is we first spin squeeze between these two nuclear spin states, as I've shown you before, by just shining in the green light for a, a controlled amount of time. And then we apply a pi pulse on the optical clock transition to transfer the spin squeeze state, um, one of the levels to the optical clock transition. And then uh, if we do it right with high, uh, with high fidelity, when the, when the pi pulse is sufficiently high fidelity, we maintain the spin squeeze state, we maintain the entanglement. So the whole, uh, before I come to that, uh, when we squeeze these two states down here, we find, um, so these are curves where we rotate this, uh, the angle and look at the minimum of the angle, we find that we can spin squeeze. So this is the standard quantum limit. Uh, coherent state has the same variance in every direction, but we see with increasing strength of spin squeezing, we can go lower and lower below the standard quantum limit, and we are ultimately limited not by our ability to make the spin squeeze state, uh, but rather by the detection. And that's something that seems to be reappearing. Very often we can make states that are much better than we can ultimately detect, even though we are a factor 10 or so below the standard quantum limit in our detection. 
So this is uh, the spin squeezing sequence for an optical clock transition, a full Ramsey sequence. We start with this block sphere in the ground state that's indicated by this violet color. So we optically pump the atoms all into one sublevel. We drive an RF pulse to create a coherent superposition between these two uh, nuclear ground states. We then shine in the green light here to spin squeeze the state. We rotate the state so that the narrow axis is in the phase direction because we want to measure phase. We then apply an optical pi pulse to one of the levels, and that transfers the spin one-half system from this system to this system, as indicated by the yellow block sphere. We now run a normal Ramsey sequence for a time uh, tau r, and then with another pi pulse, we bring the state back down to the ground state so that it back, so maps back onto the spin one-half system on the ground state that we then finally read out through our cavity method. So basically, we do all the preparations and detections in the ground state manifold. We only put the atoms into the clock state uh, for the actual uh, perform, performing the Ramsey sequence. Um, and this summarizes our result. Allen variance is here versus uh, integration time. Um, this was for relatively short uh, um, Ramsey time of um, 0.17 milliseconds. The blue data correspond to the coherence state that is unentangled. And this line here indicates the standard quantum limit. And we find that with the squeeze spin states, uh, we can um, basically be 4.4 dB or two, a factor 2.8 um, in improvement in integration on averaging time using uh, squeeze spin states. You will also notice that this um, absolute accuracy is not very good. It's nowhere near what um, June, Adam, and others can do. It was really limited by our laser, uh, our, and we are improving our laser at the moment, and you have seen uh, from June's some preliminary results where he, they did already spin squeezing with much longer Ramsey's time. So basically, this will improve as you make the Ramsey time longer with a better laser. Okay, so as I said before, our variance reduction, our metrological gain, was limited really by the detection limit rather than the attainable entanglement. So we ask ourselves, what can we do better? Um, and this brings us to this whole concept of time reversal based quantum metrology, or we call it single signal amplification by time reversed interaction or SATA. Um, this goes back really to a proposal by Monica Schleyer Smith and her group. Um, and she pointed out the following, that if you have the one-axis twisting Hamiltonian, you start with a coherent state oriented along the x-axis, you apply the one-axis twisting Hamiltonian, which makes this spin squeeze states. Then if you have a displacement phi, say, along this direction by just a little bit, if the displacement is, say, larger than the width of this state, then this state, the resulting state, is orthogonal to the original state. There's no overlap in the Wigner phase space distribution. And that means that if you can now switch the sign of the Hamiltonian and go back with minus h, then the state that you get must be uh, orthogonal or distinguishable from the original state that you started out. So, in, so you, you get a state like this, where you have a displacement that is now much larger than the small phase shift that you applied before. Right? Um, so you basically get this amplified displacement, and that solves the problem of detection, because now your detection limit is simply the coherent state width. So as long as you can distinguish one coherent state from the next one, uh, as long as your detection is at the standard quantum limit or a little bit better, you're not limited by detection at all. Um, and I remind you here that the way we do this minus h is simply by switching the, sign, the light atom detuning or light cavity tuning from one side of the resonance to the other side of the resonance that switches our side of the Hamiltonian. Um, I would like to point out that other groups have done this before. Um, the first group was Markus Obertala's group, who used um, collisional interactions in a Bose-Einstein condensate. The way they got the negative sign of the Hamiltonian, they really couldn't switch their collision. Hamiltonian, but they worked in a three-level system, S equals one, and they were able by switching, by basically switching the pi with a pi pulse, the phase of the intermediate state or the middle state, M equals zero, they were able to induce exactly the same um, backwards in time dynamics with the negative Hamiltonian. Uh, the same has been done recently in beautiful experiment by um, John Bollinger in collaboration with Anna Maria Ray, um, where they used the coupling of the spin of the ions to a motion mode of the ions to also generate a, sign, a Hamiltonian with a switchable negative sign, somewhat similar to ours. And in related work in 2016, um, Mark Kazovich and Ona Hosten uh, made something which is related. Um, it's also magnification. However, in this system, they were not switching the sign of the Hamiltonian. They were using 
forward evolution of the one-axis twisting Hamiltonian rotation and another forward evolution of the one-axis twisting Hamiltonian, which also leads to an amplified phase, but it's not quite as general as switching the sign of the Hamiltonian because it doesn't cancel high-order terms, so it's really li limited to spin-squeeze states. Um, so this is um, what the system looks like, the procedure. So here is first the spin-squeezing Hamiltonian, and then comes the displacement, and now comes the negative Hamiltonian, and you can see how the state evolves backward. And in principle, you would like to measure the whole Wigner function, but to lowest order, it's enough to measure the displacement from the original coherent state in the system. Okay, so we did this. Um, so here shows you distributions along um, the long axis along the anti-squeezing axis where we uh, squeeze for longer and longer time. So this is still a Gaussian distribution. But here we have applied the Hamiltonian for such a long time the distribution goes all the way up to the poles. As you can see, there's here more population uh, near the ends of the block sphere and then in the middle. So this is really a well beyond spin squeeze state. It's no longer a state with Gaussian, um, with Gaussian envelopes. However, when we apply the negative Hamiltonian, we find that on all three cases, even for the strongest squeezing, we can unsqueeze back and get approximately a slightly broadened Gaussian distribution. So this test that we are uh, really nearly unitary in this evolution. And so the point is how now that with this kind of system, not only are you not limited by the detection limit, but also you can use uh, over squeeze states. For instance, if you measured the variance of this state along any direction, you would find that it's not reduced beyond the standard quantum limit. This is a complicated state that doesn't have a reduced variance, and nonetheless, it can be inverted. Um, so here, uh, I show the magnification. So basically, on the horizontal axis is the signal displacement, and on the vertical axis is the resulting displace displacement after the back evolution. So we evolve forward in time, we then displace, and then we evolve backward in time. And so this black line here is the unity slope. That's basically, if you had no magnification, you can see here that one can easily, we can easily have much higher slope uh, or real magnification of the resulting displacement as a function of applied displacement. And the applied displacement is what you measure in, in the end, the phase in a Ramsey sequence. And you can see that this system performed much better. Here we show the phase Allen deviation as a function of measurements. And the take home message is that we could use one such time-reversed measurement to replace as many as 15 measurements with a coherent state. So one single measurement replaces now 15 measurements and reduces your averaging time by the same number. So this is now really becoming you know, a significant uh, gain. Um, and we also analyzed how this uh, behaves as a function of atom number. So in this plot, we have, I have two logarithmic axes. On the horizontal axis is the atom number used, and this shows different experiments, uh, you know, from a few atoms up to a million atoms. And on the vertical axis is the metrological gain in dB, so also on a logarithmic scale. Um, and you see, for instance, this is early work by Rainer Blatt, uh, which was very close. Okay, so this horizontal line here is the standard quantum limit. Um, and then this is the Heisenberg limit, so it's impossible for linear measurement to be inside this region. But you see Rainer Blatt with, I think it was seven or eight ions at the time, uh, got very close to the Heisenberg limit in ion traps. Um, and then these are various other experiments. Um, the record holders are um, Mark Kasevich and James Thompson, uh, who you know, had close to a million atoms and achieved almost 20 dB, um, dB of spin squeezing. And then the stars indicate um, systems where a full Ramsey sequence has been performed with these systems. So the, you know, the gain has been shown in a Ramsey sequence. Um, the red points are our data here. Uh, so we see that as we increase the atom number, our metrological gain improves as one over n. It improves linearly the atom number. So this is sometimes called Heisenberg scaling. It moves parallel to the Heisenberg limit. Okay, so we have fixed distance away from the Heisenberg limit, and there are various factors of 3 dB. We're about 11 dB away from the Heisenberg limit, but so far it improves um, linearly with the atom number, so which is very, very nice. We think that this will, we could not load more atoms at the time than this, although with our uh, new um, um, machine learning algorithms, we think we'll be able to now uh, load many more atoms into the system, but we think from calculations that this will go at least one more order of magnitude before it starts tapering off due to dephasing in our system. But it looks uh, very promising, I think. 
Okay, so um, finally, I would like to tell you about new paradigm, um, namely the relation between the scrambling of quantum information and quantum metrology. So if you go back to this, you know, the one axis twisting Hamiltonian was used to get this magnification of this phase displacement by forward and backward time evolution. But if you think about it, it really doesn't matter very much that we use this particular state. So if I had some state, you know, some Hamiltonian that somehow scrambles the state and, you know, deforms in some way so that it has fine structure on the, in the Wigner phase space distribution, right? then it takes only a small displacement before this state will be orthogonal to the original state, a small phase displacement. And that means if this state is orthogonal, if you unscramble with minus h, this state must be clearly distinguishable and not overlapping with the original state. So um, basically there's a cycle where if you, think about quantum, uh, if you think about quantum measurements, what you want to do is generate a state of high quantum Fisher information that has a lot of structure, then displace it, and then send it backward. Um, to magnify the system and then compare. Whereas if you think about the problem of scrambling, hiding quantum information, what you want to do is you want to scramble an information into as into many degrees of freedom as possible, and then you want to check, you know, encode the quantum information by checking, you know, how sensitive is it, is it to small displacement in the system and then information unscrambling. And this is really the protocol for out-of-time order correlators. Um, and I also point to this beautiful work by Anna Maria Ray. So here we now stopped using the SE squared Hamiltonian. We added this turn omega SX Hamiltonian, which is simultaneous one axis twisting and rotation. And this gives now rise to exponential increase of the anti-squeezing for the right ratio of omega to chi. So I want to quickly show you that. So um, this is for the not, um, for not critically tuned Hamiltonian. So it rotates and the spin squeezes and you see it develops, develops some structure, but not too much. However, if we do the same thing for the critically tuned Hamiltonian, then you will see that very quickly a lot of structure, phase-based structure evolves. So this state is incredibly sensitive, starts to become very, very sensitive uh, to small displacements uh, because small displacement will now make the state orthogonal to what it was before. And so we now use this Hamiltonian and we observed exponentially scaling anti-squeezing now instead of the quadratic one that we got from one axis twisting for the critically tuned Hamiltonian. Um, and we also measured the so-called fidelity um, out of time order correlator, which is basically initialized. You encode the system and you uh, decode backwards and you get um, a resulting, and then you measure the fidelity. These are experimental results. So this is the, we measure, we evolve the state backwards in time and then measure the overlap with the original state here along the x-axis. Um, so we uh, get this fidelity scaling as a displacement like so. Um, and this is the main result here, which is that if we, plot things as a function of the evolution time or the amount of, you know, entanglement, then you see that the anti-squeezing, the long axis, for instance, the metrological gain in green, the fidelity OTOC, the fidelity out of time order correlator, they all scale exponentially and they all scale in exactly the same way. And what that means is that we are, at, in this region here, optimally using the Fisher quantum Fisher information or near optimally using quantum Fisher information available in the system. And then for longer evolution times, our non-unitary nature of the uh, evolution kicks in and we start a decrease in metrologic gain. Um, and so I think this is uh, very important because this allows one to do quantum metrology even with quantum states that have no reduced variance um, and maybe you know, more general Hamiltonian. And I would really like to see you know, some of the concepts that Norman developed applied to this situation as well. And with this, um, pointing out this new paradigm for time reversal based quantum metrology. I would like to thank you for your attention. Thank you very much. If we could reverse time, we'd have even more time for questions, but I think we have some. So let me open the floor up. There's one on that side over there. Hi, thanks for the uh, great talk. Um, a quick question and a, another one. So uh, how do you generate the rotations of the squeeze state? And um, have you considered giving your machine learning algorithm the keys to the time reversal sort of Ramsey interferometer and seeing what it can do with it? Thanks. Absolutely. Both great questions. So this term is simply, we are doing this in the nucleus spin ground state level, which are connected by radio frequency. This is just simply just uh, shining in radio frequency light. Um, of a certain frequency and strength. So um, this is really easy to do for us. This is, you know, kind of perfect, these rotations. 
And the other question is, yes, that's absolutely where we are going. Um, I want to let the machine learning algorithm lose at this because I'm sure there are noise, noise sources in the system that we don't know about. Um, and so there's probably, you know, quantum optimized kind of path to generate states of high quantum fish information that is probably very fast and maybe more robust. Um, so this is one of our next goals. I'm, I'm very excited and optimistic about it. Mm -hmm. Other questions? First of all, th yeah, thanks for a wonderful talk. I have a couple of questions about the last section. Um, mm -hmm. So the f first one is, I wanna ask sort of whether we need to think about kind of in which Hilbert space we're scrambling. So if I'm trying to measure a global field, um, I wouldn't want something that really scrambles in the two to, right. to the n dimensional Hilbert space. Is there some way of thinking about like the symmetry of the sensing problem and what that means for the scrambling process? And then maybe I'll just, if I may, just ask one other question. Should I worry that by making something chaotic, I'm sensitive to a whole bunch of perturbations and not just one particular thing I'm trying to sense. Mm -hmm. These are both very good questions. On the first question, I can give you a sufficient answer. Clearly, we state here, try to state on the block sphere surface. So we are really scrambling only in the maximally symmetric Dicky space, not in all space. And that's clearly um, a sufficient criterion. In this uh, space, it works. I'm really not sure to what extent it works in other parts of Hilbert space. It uh, probably doesn't work in every part of Hilbert space, but I could imagine scenarios where even though you're not in the maximally symmetric manifold, you're sensitive um, to um, small phase displacements. Mm -hmm. Yes. Uh, I agree. Um, so it, you may be sensitive to different different terms in the Hamiltonian, for instance, or you know maybe a differential phase between you know like for the gravitational redshift measurement, it's clear how you would set it up, right? You would want to measure the differential phase. Um, I, I, I agree with um, I agree with that. Um, and then was there another? Yes. For certain scenarios, yes, um, if you, I don't want to go back to the movie, but that can be a strength even. So you had seen some of these states, which were, some, for instance, simultaneously sensitive to displacement along two axes. There were, you know, axes where they were insensitive, but then there were two axes they were sensitive. So that could be potentially a feature where, you know, you can you know, basically below the standard quantum limit sense both phase and amplitude, for instance, simultaneously. Mm -hmm. Question, the usual suspect, Bill. So if we could go back to the machine learning at the beginning, uh -huh. one of the things I missed seeing was uh, what was the uh, improvement in uh, the number of, uh, of condensate atoms? I'm, I'm not sure what the right question to ask is, mm -hmm. but say when you get to a near pure condensate, how many atoms uh, uh, there are? What was... Uh, so it depends a little bit on how you ask the question, right? And whether you care, you know, are you satisfied with small thermal wings? You know, <laughs> do you set things to 90% or 99%? Um, so in a typical, you know, performance similar to what you optimize by hand, we had an improvement of the atom number of a few. Uh -huh. But mainly we had an enlarged factor of a few, or? a factor of a few. But yeah. mainly we were okay. concentrating about shortening the sequence. Right. So we just got it six times faster than before. Mm -hmm. So I was intrigued by the idea that uh, the um, that the machine learning uh, decided to do evaporative cooling at the end. So did it know about evaporative cooling, or it discovered evaporative cooling on its own? No, we didn't tell it anything. <laughs> it was controlling the optical pumping power. So you can see here. These, the orange and the blue basically control how the product of the two, roughly speaking, tells you how fast it cools, so yeah. it decides to cool at the rate. It didn't tell it anything. Just yeah. always when the condensate forms, it found the minimum where in some way, one uh, yeah. did it in different way, it turned on the optical cooling. So obviously when you're deep into the BEC, optical cooling or this kind of cooling no longer works. Yeah, That's so it just reduced us. the dipole trap and let things evaporate. Exactly. Did it have control over the diameter of the dipole beams? 
No, unfortunately not. I mean, I mean that's that hard be, to do in the lens. That's hard to do, but we could, you know, well, there are these lenses. Sure. You know, so I think the more parameters, the better. In this case, we just gave it uh, control of the power. It would probably do considerably better if you also allowed it to, you know, focus the beam yeah. more or less. Because yeah. one of the hard problems, as you know, maybe from experiments, is actually loading from a single dipole trap into the cross dipole trap. That's yeah. a very inefficient process. Right. And that's where we got most of the improvement uh -huh. from that blob. Uh -huh. Okay. So I know that we are far from sated and there are many more questions, but we also have a poster session to get to. And before that, you'll remember that this is the opportunity for a photo. So after we're done here, I'm going to ask everyone from upstairs to come down so that we can all pack into the orchestra space for the photo. But first, let us thank Lot one more time and Lauren.